Thank you, Alex. Yeah, you can try it for noise purposes. At about 518, we'll get the meeting started. Now we got Mr. McCabe online and Mr. Hammond here in uh, person with us. Uh, the first item up on the agenda is review and approval of the minutes from the February board meeting. So Michelle Scott typed those up for us. Uh, Dr. Davey and our team reviewed them. We present them to you for your uh, approval. I'll make that motion. Motion by Mr. Harriman. Second. Second by Mr. McCabe. All in favor? Opposed? Aye. Moves. Excellent. Thank you both. Next up on the agenda is our external audit entrance conference. Uh, so familiar to this committee, uh, we have uh, Mike and Amy here, and um, Mike gave me a tutorial on how to say your last name, Amy, and I forgot how to do it. So, so I I was going to butcher and then have Mike correct me and give me another lesson, but we have Mike Rossi <laughs> and Amy Pedrick. Perfect. Because I say Pedrick all the time, and Mike did give me a lesson, so I apologize <laughs> for that, Amy, and no I'm too generous not to correct me. And, <laughs> Um, I'll try to be better in the future. I'll, okay. I'll, I'll forget come tomorrow. <laughs> all right. But uh, so Mike and uh, Amy have joined us from Weston Company and uh, they've been our external auditor for a number of years. Uh, we've asked them to come and be here with the audit committee. They're actually in our office today in the next couple of days uh, doing some of their pre audit work. Uh, it's an opportunity for them to talk with the audit committee and then ask for feedback from audit committee members. So with that being said, I'm gonna pass it over to the two of you. Okay, great, thank you. So um, as Eric said, we're here our on site now through Friday, looking doing some preliminary work. For, for this year's audit, there, there's only one major change um, to the audit financial statements and the audit, and that's um, what we're calling GASB 87. It's a new accounting standard for leases. Um, and it's, it's kind of a big deal to BOCES because it's not just something that you would think of as a normal lease, like a vehicle lease or an equipment lease. It's also instances where the BOCES, they're gonna be the, you guys would be the lessor to the school districts where, where a school district has maybe some computers that you've purchased for them and they have them for a period of so many years, like three years, but the BOCES holds title of those computers. Um, so things like that are gonna be leases. So that's the things we're gonna talk about um, with management while we're here, kind of get a plan to, to get this standard adopted. And it's not gonna be a huge effect on the operations, it's just a financial statement effect. It's just something that's gonna change the reporting and add more pages to the financial statements, more footnotes. Um, but that's the biggest change in our world um, this year, along with we have some new auditing standards. Nothing's really going to change that you will see except for on the financial statements, the opinion letter is going to change. It's, you know, how it used to be like on the bottom of page two, it was, you know, further in. It's the, the opinion of the financials is going to be the first thing you see now. But other than that, there's no significant changes for us in our or uh, an auditing world. So, um, some of the preliminary stuff that we're starting to look at right now, one of the things we're focusing on is trying to figure out what we're gonna test for our compliance audit, our single audit, that's that grant compliance. Um, and you guys did get a big um, pass through from the county for uh, COVID testing. So, and that's gonna be pretty substantial and that's gonna be what we're gonna be looking at as far as compliance. Last year, we looked at the school lunch fund. Normally we looked at the, look at the student financial aid. It all depends on size and risk, but this, um, the government has told us that any CARES COVID money that comes through to you guys, to any entity is high risk and we have to look at it. So that's what we're gonna look at this year specifically um, is that grant and we're estimating to be around $400,000 maybe of expenditures. We're not right, quite sure yet, but it's definitely substantial enough where we have to look at it. Yeah, let's give some background because I think we were awarded around seven hundred fourteen thousand, yes. um, but we're not planning to expend all of that. Yep. Um, so yeah, at the moment we're projecting around that four hundred thousand dollar mark. Yeah, and that that gets us where we need to be with coverage over the programs, and it's a higher risk. So we'll definitely be looking at that one. Will that probably be the, will that be the only one that is anticipated to be the only one this year. Yeah, we will follow up with some of the stuff that we saw with school lunch fund that we had in the management letter in regards to some bidding and stuff like that. But we won't have to retest that school lunch program. But we'll just follow up with some of the things that we saw when we did test that last year. But we don't have to test any other programs at this point, anyways. Well, Jessica and Claire will be very disappointed to know that cafeteria will not be audited at the <laughs> level of detail this year. We definitely thought it was, and then I saw this big county grant or pass through and I knew that was that was definitely the one so but other than that I mean in terms of like like Eric said it, it's your chance to tell us if you have areas of concern anything you'd like us to focus on other than our normal areas that we normally look at extra class and all the funds and, and all that stuff but no. talk to Christine about a problem that got taken care of so. okay perfect 
I, I would like to say one thing about this lease, GASB 87. It's always gone on in all of the school districts, and it's really just for transparency because the districts have had a three or five year payback, right? And that was never recorded on the books. And each year they would just make the payment. So it's really to show all of the debt that the districts or BOCES have taken on. So it's really just a transparency. Thing. And all things that you have receivable to you, since you know you may be the lessor, you know you may be leasing things to a district. So not only your liabilities for lease, but then your receivables for lease receivables as well. So it's more, it will affect the funds a little bit, but it's mostly that long-term financial statement, the ones that we you know talk about that are the long-term picture. Yeah, and a good point to make, and Chris can give a little more detail if I miss something here. But uh, for the committee members, uh, about a year ago, um, we started with our technology coaster in doing this where we were leasing computers to schools so they could buy computers through us and get aid on it. Um, and we started with one district and we've expanded pretty significantly. And all that actually started when we did a tour and visit under Mark's rec Dr. Davies recommendation. We went and visited Washington Saratoga Boses. They, they have a very big operation down there uh, for that. And they kind of told us like, if you could take on your districts, they would help us out a lot because they're, they're leasing it to so many districts already. If we could take some off their plate, not only that, the delivery distance, because everything ships to the BOCES, then they delivered it up north. And we really tried to model our program around them. And we've only grown from there. So you'll see that this does become probably larger and larger as we go along. Um, but I do foresee that being part of this. A, a big part of ours is the, the computers that we're leasing to districts. And we and we do Washington Warren BOCES, and they have 31 components, and they have quite a bit of land, so it really is an undertaking for them to add additional districts. So, so I think that you can pick that up. They're either the second or third largest. We're four. Yeah. And but with their 31 districts, yeah, um, they were one of our districts was belonging because we didn't have the service, mm -hmm. and they were buying 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars worth of computer equipment that was shipped to the BOCES. And then needed to get delivered to to north of Plattsburgh, mm -hmm. and they said this is not this is you know the, the incentive to support all their local districts, yeah. which they could arrange pickup and all it was it was very challenging for them. But they were so they were very supportive and encouraging for us to to you know move forward with this this coaster, and they thought we could provide better service to our districts. So they've been super success super successful on their own right and they've helped us have a tremendous start and i know mr bell miss kipman you know miss calories gray and now now miss campbell have all all really um done a nice job in working with alex st pierre to move it forward mm -hmm. right does it apply mostly to those things that districts are paying for over time or if they like if they pay all at once or is it if as long as they have use of it's the use and we we'll yes. get on our inventory yep. that's what this uh gas 87 yes is. it's the use it, it depending if they pay it all up front or if they pay it over time will change the entries but but that if whether either way it's still considered um a right to use asset on their books and a risk you know okay so i think basically they're using that we're holding ownership over yep. applies you may not have a receivable because if they, they paid it all up front but yes but they still need to know for their um, end. Tom, yes? Yeah, Mike, um, do we have to uh, uh, indicate like property of uh, on these computers or keep an inventory of them if they're in fact leased to these schools? Yes, yes, you inventory them, you insure them, they are your property. They're the BOCES test title to those and that is how the uh, school district gets state aid on that purchase or that lease, if you want to call it that. And the way we modeled it was that over time, uh, these become obsolete to CVS. So we we basically liquidate that off our books and the ownership goes to the school district at that time. If they come up missing or lost or broken or what what happens in that instance? Well, we have, so I believe Alex surplus, surplus. would be a good one to ask, but I believe we have our ownership tags on them and the district is putting theirs on them as well. And when we started this, we we told, we set up a process, I believe, with Alex and told them that each year they're going to have to have a procedure for inventorying what's in district. So that way we can identify if anything is broken, damaged, uh, taken out of inventory. So we have some processes we're going to work a little bit more on now with this GASB 87, but... 
Yep, this is kind of our first full year of uh, doing that inventory. So that'll be this year's project. And from our end, for a liability purpose, if it does get broken in district, we're having them pay the full cost of it anyway. So they are covering that full cost of that equipment um, through that lease agreement. So if it breaks in the first year, we're still recouping our full cost for that item. I see. Okay, very good. I just wondered if there was some mechanism to keep track. That's all. And it's just equipment, right? It's not like supplies if they're not inventory type supplies, um, equipment, anything those kind of thing. Yeah, right? just in it, in build it. like it could be a facilities as well, things like that. Use okay. space, you know, classroom rental, but anything that is more than one year. So if your lease agreement is one year only, it's not scoped into this accounting pronouncement. But if it's one year with the ability to extend and past experiences that been that it's been extended then that it would scope in. So it's also kind of how you write those lease agreements to get them in or out of this accounting pronouncement. Will that also include uh, routers and switches? Yep, absolutely. If they're basically with their inventory work because they have that life over a year. Yep. Yeah, and, and because this was such a, a task to do, they carved out software out of it, but next year, it's software also is going to be brought into it. So if you're storing stuff in the cloud or that stuff, and you have long-term agreements. Subscription-based soft software that we're You that can early implement, and we will talk to Christine about that because we are going to have to change the beginning net, as, net position this year on the government-wide financials. So we, again, have to change it again next year. We can maybe, depending on... If the, the information is have. readily available and if we could pull it together. So the good news is we're in the early stages and before it gets bigger, I would guess that's a good time to good time to get all those steps put in place now before. Yes, because I have a feeling next year will be even bigger. Yep. So absolutely. And we do have a lot of BOCES that are, you know, as you grow this, it will not only be you, you kind of also, I think, will be taking on the giving the information to the districts at, on their end for their year end audit. So it'll be it'll be putting that procedures in place to implement that so that going forward, you can provide them. These are the leases that you have from us. And this is because they need to get that information from somewhere. And a lot of the BOCES are kind of working with their districts to provide them with that. We got those calls yet? <laughs> Are they done after this one? <laughs> There's no, always more. No more guests. No more COVID. They don't need to stay home anymore and come up with new ones. <laughs> a question for you. Yes. I promise it's going to be more of your team. There's not people to cover it. Funny you should ask, but I'm working on some people to add staff because this is a big this is a big undertaking, yes, on all of our staff. No so. problem with it. Just want to make sure that you cover this. Yeah, we've had many discussions. So Yes, I appreciate your support, though. <laughs> but that's it for our end, unless there's any other questions. But otherwise, status quo with the audit, and then we'll plan to, to meet back here with you guys in October to go over the, the, the final product of the financial statements and present to the board afterwards. So. Okay. Yeah, one thing I'll say is that, you know, we, you've been partners in us and motivating us to move to our digitization on our HR side and yes. payroll side. And I'm, I'm proud of the progress we've made. We're not where we want to be and, you know, to a finished product, but we've made some really good strides. And um, I know you guys have helped with that process over the last two or three years now of motivating us to continue to progress. So I'm assuming you're going to dive into some of that yes. as well and follow up to last year. And mm -hmm. um, yeah. We already talked about it today. <laughs> you just knew. Yeah, we've, we've made great progress is all I'll say. Yeah. Must have that bug in the room. I don't know if Mr. McCabe or Mr. Herman have any other questions. I, do you have any questions at all or not? No, I, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. It's, uh, you know, that we're on top of it. And we are, we uh, have a plan, you know. Sure. Well, thank you. So, you know that we just concluded an extensive in-depth audit from the comptroller's office. Mm -hmm. So we, we actually had a huge, uh, you know, analysis and there were, was some, there it was something that, you know, the, the auditor found, and I think it actually turned out to be, it was very helpful for us. And they also recognized the good work that was being done internally and a lot, lot of clean audit aspects. With that said, is there any, with the, the trend of what's happening out there with 
the COVID monies and other other uses, is there any anticipated areas that might need a little more scrutiny from your perspective, just with the trends of what's happening out there in schools and, and as we're moving forward, I know BOCES are a little different, but, um, or have we pretty much covered all the bases that you think we? I mean, I think that, you know, when you look at the controller's office and what they're looking at, like you've obviously just been through it, so you have a ways to go, but a lot of what they've been focusing on now is IT related issues. Um, things, you know, the de with, with the remote learning devices we're leaving the school and the controls over the devices and all that kind of stuff. And um, that's been their main focus. It's shifted um, over the last year to more the IT, remote learning and those type of things and, and what you guys have in place. And as well as remote working controls in place if and when, you know, you guys work remotely and how that works, because a lot of offices are shifting to hybrid or however it may be, just even as a, res not because COVID's so bad now, but just as a result of what happened, they've, you know, people have found that that hybrid work environment sometimes works. So I think their biggest focus that they're really looking at is um, the IT wise. And as far as us, I mean, the districts, what we were seeing is the districts are having so much money right now. They're getting they're getting influx of the CERSA and the CRISA and the ART money, all that federal COVID money. Um, so they're going to have all this fund balance to contend with. And, and on their end, the, the, their their planning has to really happen in terms of what they're going to do with this money that they're they're getting all these millions of dollars and fund balance management, et cetera, for them is going to be, I think, a, a big thing. You think the other piece is with the increase in the foundation aid. So. Um, you know, next year is the end of that additional stream. And at this point, a num many of our districts have moved, have become fully funded. Mm -hmm. um, does that, and I know that doesn't impact us necessarily because of the state aid reimbursement, but for the, the general atmosphere in school districts, is that gonna change your focus at all much as you're, cause there's so, there's additional monies coming in. And subsequently with that, districts have more money to spend so they might actually invest more in BOCE services. If you're gonna make an investment, yes. it's a good time to make an investment when you have additional monies, because then you'll get the state aid back and it'll help support the BOCE services in the future. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I agree with that. I mean, there's nothing, the school districts are gonna have a big problem because there is just gonna to be too much money flowing into the districts. And now, you know, they can go backwards, they can go forwards, but just like when we had, I don't know, years ago, we had the era money. That was the stimulus money back then. That's all great. That's fine. That's wonderful that they have this money. But then if they don't invest it in things in which, if, if they're continuing expenses, then when that cliff happens, they have to figure out how to continually fund these things. So if they're hiring teachers, if they're doing things rather than like one-off construction projects or buying devices or ho however they're spending the money, if they're implementing new positions or they're doing things that's gonna have a continual legacy cost, they're gonna have to figure out how to fund that once this cliff ends. And that's the kind of the other thing. They have all this money now, which is great. So it's planning your reserves and planning you know, into the future when this cliff goes away. Dr. Davy, the one thing I see though is these these reserves at these districts are fully funded. I mean, they're just stuff in the. I mean, budget. we don't have a lot with it. We don't have you know I don't know your components, but the ones that we audit, we see a lot of you know very fully funded fund balance, which is great. It's necessary, but you know, once you have it, you have to you know. It's you know it's also a good time for BOCES to really invest in the things they need because to just give back surplus and heap money on top of already fully funded school districts, you know, so if you needed stuff, you really should look at spending it before you give it back. Sure, okay. Thank you. So seeing no more questions, I'd ask that you stay to the rest of the meeting if you're okay and you have time. Oh, yeah. uh, some of these upcoming topics may be involved, some feedback from you since you've, you've seen it uh, in the rest of the state. The next uh, item up is our internal audit requirement uh, discussion and options. So last time we spoke, we were hopeful that through this budget process, through our lobbying efforts and through Dr. Davies' efforts at the DS table, uh, there would uh, be a reconsideration of the latest uh, interpretation of uh, the guidance as says BOCES aren't uh, exempt from an internal audit, which was a change in uh, interpretation, not a change in any law or requirement. Uh, we've been unsuccessful. I'll tell you that to our audit committee members. There's been no change to that interpretation. So that means that we are due for an internal audit. <clears throat> so 
What we need to do is have an internal audit done between now and June 30th of 2023, really right now, but as July 1 and June 30th of 2023. Um, Christine's done some legwork on this and she reached out to Questar 3 BOCES. So Questar does uh, internal audits for a number of BOCES as well as some school districts. Um, and with their um, expertise and background in doing uh, other BOCES, it's advantageous for us to work with them. We've asked them for a quote just so we can see it and evaluate. We don't have it yet. I will tell you that they've had a number of requests flow into them. So we're currently on the wait list. Um, so we've asked for that quote just to see what it would cost and then um, see if we get off the wait list and become eligible for that audit. So we're not going to rush to an RFP this time. We want to see if we can go through the Questar process. And one thing that we've seen is we, we uh, queried our um, business officials in the area. So uh, FEH BOCES, St. Lawrence Lewis BOCES, and CVS BOCES business officials <clears throat> posed it to them and said, what are you seeing for internal auditors out there? They came back with two. Um, and then when the next question was, well, what's your satisfaction with them? How much value add are they get? Are you getting? They said almost nothing. They, they can't stand their internal audit. They think it's a waste of money and they're getting no value for it. So that told us that if we go out for RFP, we're gonna get at least two respondents. Potentially we can recruit somebody from out of the area, unlikely, but in our Northern tier, that's what's out there. And the satisfaction is very low. So we're hopeful, you know, we've heard good things about the uh, Quest Arbosa. I think Christine's had conversations with Mike and Amy as well about them. They're complimentary of their service. So that's, that's what our recommendation at this point in time is, is, is let's see what the BOCES come back with. Can we get off that wait list? We may be, you know, scrambling to do an internal audit in springtime, but I think it's advantageous for us to wait. Again, did you have any comments about that? Are you very familiar I, with that? Uh, we're very familiar with that. And um, I think that it's actually going to be due April 30th. It's going to be the due date internal audit. So I'm trying to buy a couple months. You're not well, going to get it. I, well, I, <laughs> I, I think you guys had to at least show that you're in process and you're, you're going through yeah. the, you know, the yeah. motions to get there. So I, mean, yeah. I think at least you, you're showing that part of it. Yeah. And, you know, it, this change happened when they lowered the threshold to 1,500 students. Many of the BOCES then said, well, we have less than 1,500. They opted out. It's been at least probably 10 years since you've had internal audits, I would say. Eight, 10. Probably a little under 10, but yeah. For near so BOCES really kind of got screwed in this process, you know. And I don't know what made, I think it was SED made SED. the call. Yeah. SED review the this, the go to their legal team and determine that BOCES did not meet the criteria of a school district. So it's kind of odd that they singled out 37, you know, BOCES. And there were still a few BOCES that were having single aud or, or internal audits, but not for the, we do five and none of ours really had them. So another Anything, I mean, you, you know, you brought it to us for several years. Is there anything that you see or would see? So the only thing that I think sometimes that good comes out of the internal audit is, we, you know, we focus mostly on the financial and the numbers, but, you know, sometimes I have districts where they'll come in and they'll look at tr like transportation or stacking or just things that are kind of out of our scope that are more procedural. Um, you know, so coming into a BOCES, they could look at something specific to you guys that, has a financial aspect, but it could also help improve efficiencies and, and things that we don't see every day when, we, when we're coming here. And I think that's sometimes the benefit of the, the internal audit is they can look at things that are not under our scope always. And, and I really believe that OSC just did internal audits for you. I mean, yeah. they did a full I mean, they must, assessment. Yeah. They were here for a while. Yes. That is better than you're going to get from an internal audit. Agreed. Yes. You know, so, you know, when you think about it like that, if you, I don't know what the penalty would be if you didn't have an internal audit. So if you couldn't get it done timely, I don't think there's any penalty. I know I do a district who decided they weren't gonna do it for a few years and we just submitted the last one and SED's basically taking it and that's it. You know, they were supposed to be whatever it is on that, you know, you have to upload it, but they just didn't do it. They said it was change in personnel, change in management. We didn't get to it, so. And I think as Eric said, I mean, if you have to undertake this and you have to do this, get partnering with someone who understands BOCES and understands what you guys do, at least you'll get, you know, you'll get more from the, the, the task. 
kind of thing. So, Our past track record we had three different internal auditors before we were able to claim the exemption, two of which never worked out. I think we had one company that bid on it, didn't really realize what a BOCES did, were there one day and would never come back, didn't even return our phone calls. <laughs> so I think it's even though we could get our hands slapped for waiting, I think that it's more looking at the benefit of it, what you're gonna get out of it. Um, you did just have the OSC audit. There's nothing of immediate concern. Um, and I think I, if we're gonna take the time to have somebody get to know us and get to know us as a BOCES, you don't wanna kind of be bouncing around from auditor to auditor every year when you try to have this done. Um, and I just, I worry in our area that we're, we're different than the schools. The schools they get into, they're good, and then they get into BOCES and they're like, you do what? Yeah. And, you know, and they either run or it's you get them for that one year and then they disappear and you're doing it again. So, um, and, yeah. And with the internal audit, it, it's a risk assessment each year and an area of focus. So they would come to a risk assessment and they would come to the audit committee, they would present their risk assessment. They would say, here's the areas of concern, maybe it's purchasing, maybe it's payroll, and you would select that, then they would go and audit that on top of their risk assessment. So that's how the internal audit process works. It would be much more helpful if it were like a once every five year kind of thing. I think I would maybe see a better value in that than every single year kind of repeating. Not much changes unless you have a lot of changes in staff. So. But, um, but I think with Questar, I think we have more of a, you know, they do this for so many people, so many schools and OCs, I think you'd find a, an efficiency there. So they probably have a pretty good system. So I would highly recommend waiting um, just purely because I think we'll, we'll, the benefits will outweigh the, the risks. Thanks, Jimmy. All right, so we'll give you an update on that next meeting. Um, next item up is reserve plan. So you do have a copy and, uh, of that. And Mr. McCabe, I believe you should have a digitally, a digital copy of the reserve plan. I see you had chicken yes. Um, I don't have a copy here in front of our auditors, but so I'm happy to share it. You should, there you go. Okay. It's not actually. Okay. <clears throat> so we get one. <laughs> so, so for the reserve plan, um, there you go. I, I don't want to force it to share. Okay. We're like little children. For the reserve plan, we, we don't have many changes in here um, on every single one of them. What we've done is uh, we've updated the, the change you'll see on every single one of these reserves is where we change the balances. So we did update our 2021 balances and then what are estimated June 30th, 2022 balances are going to be. So you'll see that in every single one of them. So no change in the unemployment insurance. One thing I will say in, in there is um, we had a scare, I guess you would call it, when COVID hit, um, and we were tracking to spend that whole reserve all in one year. Um, and I, I remember having conversations with our budget committee about it as we were we were planning for the use of that reserve. Um, and, and I will tell you, we were, we were projecting to use uh, more than half of that reserve to cover what we were incurring. And a lot of that was due to claims that were being approved by Department of Labor that we believed in, we were contesting, I think 40 or 50 of them uh, all at that time. Um, the state came in and the federal government came in and fully reimbursed us for those costs. So they covered uh, that cost in full. So we had no impact on our reserve. So I will tell you that in very recent years, we've had a, a, a concern and that was all gonna get spent up. But right now we don't have any concerns. It's there, it's, it's a security blanket in case something like that does happen, we have it. Um, so no change there, and we're not recommending any changes. Uh, the next one uh, on the next page, page three, you have our CTE equipment reserve. Uh, that is just maintaining that at it where it's at. Again, that had the large bump up, thanks, thankfully, to the sale of our PAI equipment. Um, we've had discussions previously about changing the methodology of this. That's continued on the docket. We're not pursuing it at this time because of the healthier balance that we have uh, in there. But some of our CT equipment well range in the fifty to one hundred thousand dollar range, and that can get used up pretty quickly. But at this point in time, it's not a priority item to change anything in that reserve. The uh, page four is our retirement contribution reserve. This now has two parts. Uh, as of a couple of years ago, a few years ago, uh, so the first part is the employee retirement reserve, um, which currently is at one point three million dollars. Um, that is for all of our non-instructional staff who are part of the employee retirement system. Uh, we pay a percent contribution rate 
for every dollar salary that they make. Um, and that reserve is in place and we're asking not to change it, not to fund it, not to spend it down this year. Uh, we're preparing for those high fluctuations in what that percent contribution is. Um, again, a lot, of, a lot of talk about a recession that's coming and, and potential issues with the stock market and that's to be seen. But if we do see stock market crashes or uh, recessions happen, the next thing that falls is an increase in the contribution percent because that re those rates, TRS and ERS, are primarily driven by their return on investment um, and the investments that are made by the retirement system. So typically what happens is the recession happens, following that the rates can skyrocket. That is the board's ability to uh, there for the board to use to help mitigate those large increases. So instead of laying off staff, we can say, all right, we can wade through a year, two years, three years, four years of these increases with the hopes that the market comes back and rates start to decline and our operating budget can catch up without a significantly large increase. Similarly, same conversation with TRS. The thing with TRS is there's limits on it. There's very specific limits, which uh, the board can only fund that up to 2% each year, 2% of our salaries, so our TRS salary, all of our certified individuals. Um, that amount is, we, we talk about it during budget, we have about $10 million in certified salaries that we pay on an annual basis. So 2% of that, about $200,000. Annually, we can fund, there's a cap of 10%, but we have funded this now for uh, three years. Um, and we'd be requesting to do it again for a fourth year um, this year. So again, that would get us to about 80% of the cap. And then our goal would be to fund it again next year. So that $200,000 again next year to get us at a fully funded level. The board at any time has no limit on how much of that you could spend. So that once we was fully funded and we'd be about a million dollars in that reserve, the board would have authority to spend as much as you want. But as we started to rebuild it back up, hopefully in better times, you would still only be limited to that 2% each year. So I think, you know, as a goal of our organization is every year we need to be planning for a 2% funding of TRS, and that should be a high priority because we're only allowed by law to fund it 2% each year. Um, so you can see there, that is a recommendation for contribution, and I would say that's our highest priority. So as we come to the board in June, that is a, that's gonna be one of the board resolutions that Dr. Davies is gonna be bringing forth to you is to fund that reserve. I, I'm saying $200,000, uh, Christina is projecting 190,915, it looks like is what you're projecting at this time. So resolution forthcoming in June for that. Next is another priority target of ours to fund employee benefit accrued liability reserve. Currently, um, or at least we ended last year at a million dollars in the reserve. Our liability was $1.6 million. Uh, we are, this is for our um, uh, separation payments for retirees at the time of retirement. Uh, so the biggest drivers are sick leave payouts to individuals at the time of retirement, as well as, which is a smaller amount of this, is our vacation payouts at the time that they leave our organization. Um, so liabilities at 1.6, reserves at a million. Our recommendation at this time, and we're projecting to recommend it, or Dr. Davies is going to recommend it at the June meeting of about $300,000 funding of that reserve. That would get us to 1.3 million, so it cuts that difference in half. Um, one thing that we're monitoring here is that one of the drivers uh, for this is we do have a side letter for, for our CVS United Professionals, our teachers, teaching assistants, and the other members in that group that bumps up the dollar amount per day that they get paid out because we negotiated in there, we remove Medicare reimbursements and we negotiated in contributions in retirement. And one of the gifts that we made was that we're going to pay them out for the sick leave a total in $20,000. Their statement was, if we do this now, anyone retiring in the next five years has had time to accumulate all their sick leave, they weren't anticipating it. So the give back we did was a side letter that lasted for the life of the contract five years, um, sorry, four years of the contract runs out um, at the end of 2024. So for any sick leave payout after that time frame, the dollar amount per sick day is much less. So we foresee our, res our liability going down. Christine's actually done some projections for us, and we're more in that range closer to a million than we are 1.6 as we project today. Um, so even really around that $1.1 million. 
a lot's going to happen between now and then. So what we see forthcoming is in that contract as of anyone retiring on or after July 1 of 2023 contributes in retirement towards their health insurance premium and they don't get Medicare reimbursements. That is a massive retirement incentive for our CVS United professionals, our teachers, our teaching assistants. 190 of our members are in that group or our employees are in that group. So we foresee a lot of retirements next year. So that we're projecting that in our admin budget for future years, next year's budget discussions are gonna include those conversations, but also tied to that is a, is a large amount of sick leave payouts that are gonna happen in next the next school year. So in 22, 23, we're projecting that that $300,000 will all be used. So yes, when we look to the future in a couple of years, our liability we're projecting to be much less than 1.6, not much less, but smaller than 1.6, Again, negotiations can impact that. As we negotiate more and more contracts and whatever sick leave buyouts end up being, that can impact our liability. But as of today, we know we're going higher. We know our 1.6 is gonna come down in a couple of years. However, in between there, we're gonna have at least $300,000 in expenses just for sick leave buyouts of our CVS United professionals who will retire between now and June 30th of 2023. So we're asking you to fund it. We are looking long-term here. We do know that our, our liability is coming down as of the way we're negotiating now, but that, that big liability is, is becoming current. We're gonna have a big current liability and this can help us. So that way we don't find ourselves at $500,000 in this reserve after we make all those payouts next year, we're prepping for that. And that's why our recommendation is $300,000 at this time uh, into that reserve. I said a lot, I don't know if I explained it clearly. It's a very complicated item and it, we're working with our team and Dr. Davey um, to, to really try to get this right and make the right recommendation in June. As of today, as we're sitting here, um, that's where we're projecting uh, or proposing a $300,000 uh, increase to that reserve. I think what you're saying, we're gonna have, if this comes to fruition, replace a lot of teachers. Correct. And they're not out there. Correct. So I'm seeing and thinking that we're going to have to do something to try and stave off some of these retirements. So our goal, if I may, um, is have them retire and come back and work. So right now they can. So they've actually put off the um, TRS limitations where you can only earn $35,000 in retirement. That limitation is not there. So one thing we're targeting is to have retirees come back and work for us. Go ahead and retire so you can enjoy the benefits of what the contract is, but don't stop working. Get your free health insurance and retirement, get your Medicare reimbursements, come back and work for us, and we'll pay you more salary even. We're not gonna start you at, at starting level, we'll pay you a higher salary to come back. And how that benefits us is our admin budget's gonna carry their health insurance, right? They're gonna carry the retiree costs. Our program budget, we budget typically for a vacancy, uh, starting salary plus family health insurance. We're already gonna carry this health insurance anyway, so let's bring them back in, just pay them their salary and not have that added health insurance cost in our program budgets. So all of our districts participating in our services benefit from that. So that's one of our goals. Now, that, that only accomplishes so much because some people are gonna go off into retirement and enjoy retirement. So we, yeah, we, uh, we have to look at other strategies and be creative between now and the end of next year. And even potentially sooner than that, as we start to look at special education is a high need area and there's limited people certified in special ed that are available. So between now and even September 1, I think we're having more talks about how can we get some recruit individuals to our area from outside of our area. That's getting them up here is a problem. Mm -hmm. yep. So that's going to be definitely something we need to work on. So we've had a significant transition, especially with special ed. We did lose a lot of our, we did have a number of CTE teachers retire over the past two years. I think 12 to 15 come to mind just in ballparking it. But we've lost six to eight teachers in our special ed program this year. Some, one, one is leaving to go teach in the prison. I want to say not to go to prison, but to go to prison. Um, I, 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 cabinet did correct me when I stated it <laughs> that way. Um, so they said, make sure you stress she's going to be teaching in the prison. Um, and it's, it very likely may be a better thing. We've had other teachers move to Rochester. 
for the spouse. And so in other words, it, and, and then we've had some teachers who have left for higher pay in component districts. And on average, they've been paying five to $10,000 more than we, we've been paying. So we have taken some steps. I know, Mr. McCabe, you, you've been at our meeting and taken some steps re regarding some reimbursement for our aides. Right. We're, we're very likely going to be looking at some similar examination and, and some funding, some additional you know, staff incentives, because one of the, and I'll, we'll just share, and this is what will be talked about tonight, one of the points that's coming out in our survey is a lot of our staff are saying, you know, the reason why people were not encouraging people to come here is the salary. They can make more money in, in, in component districts. And so that's something we, we need to at least acknowledge because we, we provide tremendous training and people don't stay with us just because they, you know, they don't, it's not just the money why people come to us. It's not just the money why people stay. They want to be reimbursed well, but there's also culture. There, there's lots of other things. And, and I think the pandemic has been challenging. We'll talk about that tonight. But it's also, as a whole, been more challenging to find great people because they're not out there the way they used to be. You so know, I, I stopped at Champlain Valley Electric tonight to pick up some parts. And I was talking with Paul, the owner. And the one gal that he had working there who was great, you know, electrically and so on and so on, she's gone to work for a, a lumber company. They offered her fifty-five thousand dollars a year to start with no sales experience. So you know that's where we're dealing with problems of you know. Yeah. And I was also telling them that we read down the internet where uh, Kawasaki was having a problem out there, but they are getting people for their factory. They've gone to a ninety-two shift. Now they got all kinds of people. Because you get the mothers that want to be home in the morning with their kids, They'll be home in the afternoon, they can work five hours, make good money, no nights, weekends. They said it's working out great. Yeah, they had to retime their, their, their line, but you know, they, they've done some creative thinking and we may have to do some creative thinking. Great. The last page of this is just a summary of kind of what we said. Um, uh, we talked about and looking to fund a benefit accrued liability reserve as well as the TRS reserve. And, and again, Dr. Davies work on a recommendation for the June board meeting. Christine, anything else to add? Um, there was a, just a couple quick things. I didn't know if we wanted to just give a, there's not much to report state audit update. I don't think we received that report. On reserves, let's stick with the reserves. Oh, for reserves, no, not for reserves. And Dr. Davies, anything else you'd like to add? No, the only only point, and I know both Mr. McKay and Mr. Hammond have been on the board for a number of years. There was a few years ago that we did utilize some of our reserves to help offset offset some of the huge increases that we had. Mrs. Myers, my first year, uh, I believe CV Tech had like a half to three quarters of a million dollar hole. The next year it was special ed or it was vice versa. So we had some huge holes that we were addressing. And at that point, we used some of our, uh, I believe it was our our liability. We, we used some of our different reserves. ERS. Yeah, ERS or TRS, and, and we, but we've since been funding them back to where they were. So there, the importance of having them there, good. We've got, I wanna commend our financial planning team, our, our leadership team, because they've really paid attention to the details and the trends and, you know, our whole accounting team and it really has done a nice job. So we're, we're I'm very pleased to, to make the, have the recommendations which are coming forward are sound um, and also well thought out. Thank you. Uh, any questions from our committee members? Yeah, yeah Eric, uh, there was one reserve that had a shortfall and I think you've explained uh, uh, how it can be reestablished but it takes, you can't do it in one year or whatever. Well, I, I don't have it right in front of me here, but I thought there was one reserve that we had a deficit in. Is that? Yep. Yeah, TRS reserve. So we funded it at 6% of our TRS salaries. Um, we can go up to 10%, but they only, the law only allows us to go 2% per year. Um, so, yeah, so that's, uh, we're about $400,000 underfunded there. And okay. also Eblar, Eblar is underfunded as well. So that's 
That's the one when you get your report each year, we usually show how much it's underfunded is the MLR one as well. Right. There, the one we're there, going to put money into. Right. Is that also in a situation where you, there's a limit to how quickly you can uh, refund it? There is not. You just can't fund it above the estimated liability for Evelar. Okay. So are we then we that's why we're trying to project out the possible impact of once we get past these two years, trying to just project what it could be because we want to make sure we don't overfund it at this stage or in these years, only to have to turn around and give it back to districts. So that's why we're trying to be cautious and conservative with our funding of it now. And to uh, Mike's point, he had, he had talked about the surplus, right? Now's a good time if you're gonna have a low surplus to get back. So as part of that, this, this $500,000 we just talked about to, tonight, that comes right out of surplus. So one of the big things between now and the June meeting that Dr. Dave is looking at um, and, and relying on us for is, is what does that surplus look like? So do we have $500,000 to fund into our reserves and still have some surplus to give back to districts? Um, and that's the big question mark, which we're projecting this time that we do have it. And then could it potentially, Mr. McCabe, to your point, Instead of coming to you with a three hundred thousand dollar recommendation of employee benefit accrued liability, could it be four? It could be. It could be four fifty, right? And then it all depends on that analysis of where we come in, and then also that projection we look at to say, all right, in two years when that when that MOA comes off the books in twenty twenty four, where's that liability going to be at, and are we going to spend it down to that point so we're not finding ourselves in a situation uh, where we're overfunded? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So that wraps up our reserve plan. Uh, we did have a couple other items to talk about, and, and Christine, I know you're itching and ready to go. Um, uh, so, so the first one, uh, the state audit. Um, so, Christine, you were ready to go there, and um, was the preferred group. We discussed it. Uh, last meeting, we had some projections. Those projections haven't really changed, but it'd be good to just follow up and close the book on that. So could you talk a little bit about the state comptroller's audit? Um, I believe the state comptroller's, comptroller's audit, we're just waiting for their report. And I don't believe we've received anything yet or any word from them. Yeah, so plural reports, right? So uh, when they were here the first time, they, were, they did the ERS audit. ERS audit. They had some findings they told us about. They well, said they were expecting some findings to be in the report. And said, so, yeah, just, and they told us we'd get it. I think we've heard now for four months we were receiving it. I think it was when Dr. David and myself were told that we keep hearing it's coming, but we haven't received it yet. And then the report of their in-depth full audit of our organization is also outstanding. So no timeline. So if it comes in, it may be something we have to reconvene the audit committee just to review. But um, at this time, I think I've, I've talked to Kevin and he's like, yeah, I'm not sure when they're going to be able to get to it. It's in the review stage. So um, he's on to an FEH BOCES now. So um, he's just, he said he was waiting as well. So I should know this answer. Uh, 90 days to respond. How, how long do they give us to respond? I think it's 90 or six. Yeah. I used to write. They give us a draft. And then we have a chance to respond to the draft before it becomes final, I believe. So I want to say that might be 30 days to respond to the draft, and then it becomes final. And then we have, I believe, 90 days to issue our uh, corrective action plan, our more formal response. So they do give us a chance to review the draft before it becomes official. So at this time, all we believe it's going to be on it is the PGP thing. Um, and basically, um, can I move on? Yeah. That was the time to move on to that. So uh, we finalized PGP. We think we finalized it um, in partnership with the auditor. They did a Kevin did a great spreadsheet to kind of summarize it all for us. Um, we did receive our last check that we were owed in April. So seven years worth of prior years information and closeout. We believe we've captured. Um, I think we were owed about ninety three thousand, a little bit over ninety three thousand, and we received ninety four thousand and change. Um, so we actually made out on the deal a little bit, and we're going to close out and say we're good um, and move forward. So we seem to be on a good level playing field from this point forward with them and um, have a very tight thumb on our plans at this point with them. So and we are actively um, working with uh, nine component districts as well as 
uh, the BOCES to start our own HRA FSA coaster. There's a recommendation coming to the board tonight on the addendum from Dr. Davy to hire a benefit specialist. That individual is part of that, uh, starting our HRA FSA service. I will tell you, there's been a lot of legwork in the last month that's already happened. Uh, we actually have a meeting with Jackie Kelleher tomorrow to progress legal wise um, to that transition and making sure that all, all our I's are dotted, T's are crossed. But CVS will be starting up and being our own HRA FSA um, COSER, and the districts will get BOCES aid back on the administrative fees of that COSER. And we're looking forward to you know starting that and then building on it and making it the best it can be. I'm sure there's going to be some hurdles along the way and some bumps in the road, but uh, Vicki Drew, our benefits director, is, is spearheading that, and uh, we fully plan to be moving in that direction here come July 1. There is going to be lag, so there is different start times for flexible spending accounts in HRA, and we're working on a lag period, too, where we're going to have to maintain this relationship with the vendor. Um, so there, there will be two operating at the same time, but we're working through all those details. Can I, I ask one, one just housekeeping question? So the FSA calendar for CVS, it's the first time I've ever seen it end on the end of September and start October 1st. It's just an unusual calendar. Normally it's through December 31st. July 1, so it's a calendar year versus, is there any consideration of us ever making a, that change to a, to, a cal to a calendar year instead of a unusual year? Yeah, so we actually met with our districts to see and we asked them. So we surveyed our districts to see when they start. None of them really follow the calendar year for flexible spending and in discussions about why not, a majority of your new hires start in September for school districts. So when they join on in September, then they have the opportunity to sign up for flexible spending, and then it starts October one. So then you're allowing all of your employees to enjoy in on that, join in on that benefit. And it just really is because of that ten month school calendar. Yeah, mm -hmm. that makes sense. Yeah. Financially wise, accounting wise. So it, well, otherwise it doesn't be school district wise yeah yeah so so to just it's fun thinking it's quirky quirky um but i mean this is the best way to describe it because i know most districts that i've and i've been in a number of them and jump moved continue moved up over the years but traditionally you know it was strange when you started to someone place july 1st you you know it was prorated up to that point and it was prorated up to the that then the new new year started but it generally was the end of the, the calendar year. However, just throwing this out, if you ever did, but that doesn't make sense to stay July 1 to June 30, could be another option, but that wouldn't capture the new employees unless they started with only you know, 10 twelfths instead of 12 twelfths type of thing. The complication with starting in July, especially with an FSA and dependent care, um, and we've actually, it's funny because it was one of those plans that just like, yep, it happens, it takes care of itself, it does it, but now that we've gotten into it a little bit more, we're learning a lot about these plans. Like, oh, well, why, why is there difference? So we've had a lot of these conversations. What we're finding is with some of our school districts that we're planning on pulling into this plan, one of the biggest hurdles right now is some of their plans do start in July. And the problem with that is their employees, their 10-month staff are not contributing in July and August because their contributions don't start until September, but when you have a plan start in July, they basically have access to 100% of that money. So if they put $2,000 in that plan, True. they could take all 2,000 in July and they could quit and then go to another district in September and we really legally have no way to recoup that money. That so sense. that's why I think, okay. I, and I didn't realize that. And then we started talking, it was like, oh my gosh, you could be out. Right. I mean, if people played that game right. so I. I think we have a pretty good date. It is awkward, right. very awkward. Um, but I think the ramifications of a different date might be worse. Yes, no, so, I, I understand. So I, which yeah. is something new we didn't really, I had no idea until we got into this. So it's been a really good learning experience um, so for this to happen, actually. I can remember in when I left my former district, my business official saying, well, you know, you're entitled to the rest of that money. And I said, oh no. I said, I, I left. Prorated, I said, let's, I, I will only utilize up to my prorated amount after that, you know, because I, otherwise the district would have been funding it because I was funding it through my regular paychecks. And I said, oh no, we're right to the penny. 
that's where we are. To, and, and I had communication to make sure my business official and treasurer all, uh, because I, it felt not clean. It didn't feel like it, like it was clean. And I said, so we just need to follow uh, follow what I feel is com is a comfortable standard. Um, so that's the standard nice. I maintain. But I do understand that as well. So yeah, yeah, great points. Yeah, thank you. There was one last item, and it's a follow up to last meeting, and that is, and Mr. Hammond brought it up. That sounds like you guys are at a conversation, but so just for the committee, is that it was brought up about the holiday dinner, and we said that Christine would follow up on and review it. So Christine, could give a, a follow up to that. Yes. So we pretty much kind of backtracking is always a little bit trickier, but we were able, I was able through Megan to kind of, I think to what I feel is material enough confirm that we did get all that money deposited to the best of our ability. Um, and, but it was good because me and Megan also talked about for next year, we already have a procedure in place and stuff she can get us um, and how she can actually also reconcile it to make sure all the money's deposited. Cause that's really what, if you're organizing it, that's the person that really should be making sure it's there. So um, so we confirmed we were good for last year and we have even better steps in to make sure we're 100, I could tell you 100% that we are okay for next year. Um, so we definitely, we've got that. Megan was on top of it. So and, and by Megan, you mean Megan Rabbit and District Clerk? District Clerk, yes. Yeah, we're gonna work on a chart. We're doing that. chart already. And the other, other piece we could do is, and I know that over the years we, we, we worked we worked with uh, James Gregory for our policy. There have been some of our policies that we moved into administrative procedures. So that may be an area just to have an administrative procedure or protocol that's that's just written and shared and shared with the board publicly. So that way it's it's you know very transparent and it's above board and it's also on file. Now I can remember several years ago that the servers came around and collected it. Before we started to get up and get going, and that didn't happen this year. Yeah. It's in the so we're going to we'll work with Michelle. We have a couple of things we're going to work on in the cash collection area with some other programs. Um, it's one of the things we've been trying to is with new staff and that stuff coming on. We've got everybody kind of in their place now. So we're going to be that's kind of one of those next areas that we talk about for internal audit. It's one of my biggest areas of concern is the collections in the divisions by all the teachers with all these different things we got going on. So we are going to revisit that with them, hopefully. 22-23 and try to at least get them back on track, at least knowing what they're supposed to be doing. So we monitor them, but we got to just kind of fine tune our our expectations with them. Thank you, Christine. Uh, that wraps up our agenda. Anything from our committee members? I move that we adjourn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Second. Got a second. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Excellent. Thank you very much, everyone. And yeah, thank you, Mr. McCabe. Yeah, that's 615. Myers, thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. And Thanks. we'll see you tomorrow. Maybe I'll see you Friday because we're here through Friday. Frederick and Mr. Rossi, thank you. Okay. So, see you guys Friday. Okay. Are you going back to Plattsburgh or do you? Yeah, we're going back to Plattsburgh. Okay. We'll be there tomorrow morning around 7 a.m. working. I got there early today. I'll have you know because I was going to beat them there today. Tomorrow. You didn't meet us? I did. You did meet us. Oh, yes. you did? Today, but not tomorrow. Tomorrow you're going away. I'll get me. Meeting early.